We're going to commence this evening by turning to the hymn 383. There will never be a sweeter story, story of the Savior's love divine. Three at three, and we'll stand together as we sing, please. Bow together, please, in the attitude of prayer. And let's seek the Lord's face for his blessing upon our coming together. I can we encourage you to pray, beloved? Maybe, maybe you're in the meeting tonight or tuned in. You're not sealed. Praying is just foreign to you. Well, you should pray now, Lord, come and cause me to hear thy speaking voice. Give the preacher a word for my soul. Don't let me miss what God would have to say to me. Let's talk to the Lord. Our eternal God and gracious Father in heaven, we bow once more in thy sacred presence, acknowledging that thou art God and beside thee there is none else. Thou art the God of creation. Thou art the God of our salvation. Lord, we thank thee Thank thee for him who is the theme of our song this evening. Truly, the love of Jesus is something wonderful. Oh Lord, we have a a world that's coming down with music and song, much of it purporting to be about the subject of love. Yet, Lord, it's something that really this world knows nothing about the love that drew salvation's plan, to think that here we are, everyone born in sin, born with our backs toward God, born at odds with our Creator, and deserving of utter banishment from thy holy presence. For our finite minds can't begin to take in the holiness of God without the one with 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 whom it is impossible to sin. And here we are, born in sin, shaping in iniquity, sinners by nature and by practice, 
everything we do obnoxious to thee, yet out of thy great love for us, while we deserve to be banished from thy presence, rather thou hast in love provided a way back. Thank you, we can say there is now a way back to God from the dark paths of sin. A door has been opened where all may go in. A Calvary's cross is where we begin when we come as sinners to Jesus. We thank the Lord for that lovely verse in thy word that reminds us that God so loved this world that he gave, gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish and have everlasting life. Thank you, Lord, that whilst the wages of sin is death, thy, and thy word would, would show us it's appointed unto man once to die. But after this, the judgment. And Lord, we realize that if a man or a woman die in sin, unconverted, unready, unrepentant, then they must suffer eternal separation from thee. But we're glad also to know that it's not thy will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And we thank thee for this way back. Thank you, Lord, there's a Savior who has taken the sinner's place. We thank the Lord for every remembrance of Calvary. We thank thee that there on that middle tree, the sinless Son of God took upon himself our sins and our sorrows, made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary of suffered and died alone, there bearing that wrath that was our due. And we thank thee that we can... He, he was able to utter that word of triumph as he finalized his work of atonement. He said, it's finished. We rejoice, the work is done. And all the sinner has to do is come and lay hold upon Christ. Trust in his finished work, his redeeming love, pleading the cleansing power of his precious blood. And we thank you for that word that assures us the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. So there's hope tonight. Oh, we live in a world, Lord, that has lost its way. A world that is in chaos tonight because of sin. We see it on every hand. But we thank thee. Christ is the remedy. We pray, Lord, in this meeting time, I and in every meeting like it, that wherever thy word is opened and Christ is presented, that men and women, young people would recognize, here's the Savior that I need. Here's my hope for eternity. Thy word would show us. Except a man be born again, he could not see the kingdom of God, but we thank thee, Christ is the answer. Jesus said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. And so we thank thee, Lord, we have one to present tonight to men and women, to boys and girls, one who's able to save to the uttermost all that come unto God by him. Our prayer is, Lord, that thou wilt be pleased to do that work within the heart. Open blinded eyes, unstop the deaf ear, Lord. Bring that dear soul to a recognition of his need. Bring him to that place where he'll cry out, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. And we thank thee that thou hast promised him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. We pray, Lord, up and down this land, Across the seas, wherever thy word is being proclaimed, the old, old story of redeeming love, prosper it this night, we pray of thee. Save the lost. We ask that thy kingdom might be extended. Oh, that this night there might be joy among the angels as sinners come and make their peace with God. Or oh, there's no other hope. There's no other hope for mankind but in Christ. Help us in this meeting time to make much of him. And we pray that thou'll be pleased to do that work that no man can do. Draw souls unto thyself and grant that as a result, men and women, young people will come and close in with thine offer of mercy. And in all these things, glory will be brought to thy great name. Come, do us good, we ask of thee. Magnify thy name among us. We pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Let's uh, further sing, please, from the hymn 351. <clears throat> when peace, like a river, attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, 
and has taught me to say it as well. Well with my soul. Can you say that tonight, beloved? Is it well with your soul? We'll stand again as we sing. Think on the words as you sing them. And sing it as unto the Lord.
Amen. It's good to be able to sing those words and mean them and know the experience as well with your soul. We invite you to turn, please, with us for a scripture reading to Mark's Gospel and chapter 5. Mark's Gospel, chapter 5, and breaking in at verse 21 of the chapter, portion that's well known, I'm sure, to us all. Verse 21, and when Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side, much people gathered unto him, and he was nigh unto the sea. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet, and besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. And Jesus went with him, and much people followed him and thronged him. And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood twelve years, And had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. And she heard of Jesus, came in the press behind him and touched his garment. For she said, If I may but touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, And she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned about him in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou who touched me? And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing, But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace, and be whole of thy plague. While he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, Thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master? any further. As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. And he suffered no man to follow him, save Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And he cometh to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and seeth the tumult, and them that wept and wailed greatly. And when he was come in, he saith unto them, Why make ye this ado and weep? The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. But when he had put them all out, he taketh the father and the mother of the damsel, and them that were with him, and entered in where the damsel was lying. And he took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, Talitha kumai, which is being interpreted, Damsel, I say unto thee, Arise. Straightway the damsel arose and walked, for she was of the age of twelve years. And they were astonished with a great astonishment. And he charged them straightly that no man should know it, and commanded that something should be given her to eat. Amen. May the Lord bless these verses to our hearts for his name's sake. Just at this point, I'm going to ask our brother, Mr. Todd, if you bring us some necessary announcements. Please, thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. You're very welcome once again along to our evening gospel service. If there are any visiting with us, you're most welcome as you've joined with us tonight. And we trust that the Lord's presence might be felt in his house here tonight as we worship him. I'd like to welcome those who have joined with us online. And you're most welcome also. And we thank you for joining with us. May the Lord bless you wherever you worship from tonight. Just a few announcements, a reminder of 
uh, things which I had said this morning. Uh, first of all, uh, the midweek meeting will be on Tuesday at 8 p.m., and God willing, the Reverend McLaren will be the speaker at that midweek meeting. The open-air meetings in June begin this Friday. That's the ones led by the Youth Fellowship. Um, this Friday, the first meeting is in Mournview, and that's at half past seven. And if you are available on Friday night, you'd be most welcome to join with the young people for that open-air meeting. Next Lord's Day will be Children's Day. We'd like to give everyone a warm invitation to both of the services next Lord's Day at the usual times of half past 11 and 7. Special speakers will be in the morning, Mr. Noel Shields, and in the evening, the Reverend Ryan McKee. The times of prayer will be in the committee room 45 minutes before each service. And then in relation to the Sunday school, the Sunday school trip will be on Saturday the 18th of June, after the children return to the church that afternoon at around about half past three, there will be games and activities for the children, followed by a barbecue. And that games afternoon and barbecue are open to all in our congregation. So if you're free that Saturday afternoon, you'd be very welcome to come along and join with the boys and girls and the parents as well. If you do plan to be uh, in attendance at that uh, afternoon, especially the barbecue, there are a couple of sheets on the hall table. Please do fill in your name to let the people know how many are coming. Uh, last week, we ha had our offering for the Whitfield College of the Bible, which came to £1,101. And we'd like to thank you once again for supporting our Whitfield College and our students. And then finally, I would just like to give uh, a warm welcome once again to our, well, he's not even a visiting speaker because he's one of our members, the Reverend McLernan, and we're glad to have him uh, speaking for us tonight. And we pray that the Lord will bless his ministry as he did this morning, and pray that the Lord will bless him tonight as he preaches to us. These are all the announcements. Thank you. Thank you again, Ian, for the, the announcements and words of welcome. Thank you to you all for. Uh, making us, uh, for encouraging in our hearts this morning. It's good to share God's word with you. We trust that he'll bless even this evening too. And a lot of you I know by face and a lot of names I still have to learn. I'm sorry if I don't always call you by your name. I don't know the half of you. But it's lovely to be with you. And we trust the Lord will bless his word even to our hearts tonight. Just before we turn to that word, I'm going to sing from the hymn 252. 252, softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. I trust if you're not saved this evening that you'll respond to that call. Come and trust the Saviour and start out for heaven and for home. 252, we'll stand together as we sing, please. <laughs>
Can we invite you to turn, please, to that passage we were reading in Mark chapter 5. And with, uh, with God's word open before us, let's just unite our hearts for a moment in prayer as we seek the Lord's help. And again, let me encourage you to pray, Lord, come, speak to my heart. If you're saved tonight, haven't you something to rejoice in? Can't you praise the Lord that he ever lifted you out of your sin, saved you? He's promised you a home in heaven. If you're not saved, you should pray, Lord, Help me to get a hold of this truth that Jesus Christ died for me in order to save my soul. We sang earlier that the love of Jesus, something wonderful, and it is, more than we can take in. We're undeserving of it. And thank God this salvation is free tonight to the whosoever will. Our loving Father, we acknowledge our own nothingness, our indebtedness to thee. Thank thee if it wasn't for Christ, his atoning work at Calvary, we would be without hope tonight. But we thank thee that he came and gave himself as a ransom and is able this evening to reach that dear soul at the point of his or her need, able to save to the uttermost. And we pray, Lord, that thou'll be pleased to bless thy word, even now well, we're all familiar with it. We pray that nevertheless something will be said, that thou, thy Holy Spirit will take and carry home to that waiting heart, though that there might be a ready response this evening, that some would seek the Lord while he may be found and call upon him while he is near. Bless thy word, even now we ask of thee, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be familiar with the reports of the, the great fire that swept through the city of Chicago back in 1871. I'm not sure how the fire started, but as you can imagine, uh, many properties in those days would have just been built out of wood. Indeed, many still are in the United States. And we wonder sometimes with there are areas where they are they have hurricanes and all sorts of things, and there are so many houses built with timber. But I'm sure a big part of that city of Chicago must have been timber framed, timber built. Anyway, the fire started on the eighth of October, and it burned for three days. It was sometime on the tenth before it was fully extinguished. But in the process, something. In the region of eight and a half square kilometers of city were destroyed. As I understand it, only six buildings actually survived. And that maybe not even in totality. One of those buildings was a church. The walls remained. As I understand, the inside of the church was burned. But imagine, the, the, the cost back then was estimated at $222 million. By today's standards, we're talking something in the region of $4.7 billion. It took two years to rebuild that city. You can only imagine the awful devastation as the flames raged. And it was discovered that, sadly, that 300 lives were lost. Some 100,000 people were left Homeless. A man by the name of Horatio Gates Spafford, now you've heard his name, I'm sure. He was one of those who tried to help people to get back on their feet after that tragedy. I mean, 17 and a half thousand buildings were destroyed. Spafford was a Chicago lawyer. He had invested heavily into the downtown area, but he lost everything because of the fire. But if that wasn't enough, he had only just a short time before that 
lost his own son, a young lad. Lost him to, I don't know what the disease was, but you can imagine that this man was finding it difficult. Still, for the next two years, he assisted the homeless, the impoverished, the impoverished, the, the grief-stricken, and did all he could to help people through that awful calamitous time. By the end of those two years, he felt understandably that he and his family should take a holiday. So he decided on England. He thought, well, D.L. Moody is over there, Iris Hankey, and they're conducting meetings, evangelistic crusades, and had been traveling through Europe, and he thought it'd be nice to go over and hear D.L. Moody preaching in England. However, the family were packed and ready to go when something came up and he had to be delayed in Chicago. Business commitments demanded his attention, so he sent his wife and family on ahead. His wife had four daughters. I'm sure you know the story. They arranged to meet on the other side of the Atlantic. But that ship, the Ville de Havre, never made it. Somewhere off the coast of Newfoundland, that vessel collided with an English sailing ship and both of them sank within about 20 minutes. Horatio's wife, Anna, was one of only 47 survivors picked up clinging to a piece of floating wreckage. The four daughters were lost at sea. Spafford received a telegram some time later from his wife. She had made it to England. Just two words on the telegram. Saved alone. And he boarded the next available ship to get over to England to be with his grieving wife. And as the ship passed near the spot where the tragedy had occurred and where his four daughters had gone down, he felt inspired of God to pen the words of the hymn we sang just a a few minutes ago, when peace like a river attendeth my way when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say it as well, as well with my soul. Could we have done that? Can you say tonight, beloved, it is well with your soul? Well, there's more to the story and more to the hymn, but it's, it's an illustration of how the Lord can work in the midst of tragedy and trying times. We've all been impacted by some form of difficult situation, tragedy of one kind or another at some stage in life. Now, whether it be from illness, infirmity, the death of a dear one, oh, any of Thousands of things that can touch us as humans, whether it's the pain of a broken body, a broken heart, a broken spirit. Tragedy in some shape or form has touched us all, hasn't it? Whether pain is in the natural or spiritual sense, we've all been affected. But in those circumstances, the Lord Jesus has said, in the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. John 16, 33. Job commented on the plight of man when he said in Job 14, 1, man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. He's right, wasn't he? What we must remember is the Lord Jesus is more than adequate to take care of any situation. The rest of that verse in John 16 says, these things have I spoken unto you that in me ye might have peace. That's something we mustn't forget. Here in Mark chapter 5, we're confronted with a father who's experiencing a very trying situation. His wee girl, she's 12 year old. 
Maybe that's some parent here. But that day, death was going to take that little one out of the home. Uh, wouldn't that break any father's heart? Here he was, heartbroken. But in the midst of his tragedy, he turned to the Lord Jesus Christ. He discovered that he is more than enough for any situation. A few things I want to observe about this situation I trust the Lord will use to encourage you, if you're not saved, to seek the Lord. I'd even comfort God's own people. Notice here, firstly, there's a pitiful dialogue. Verse 22, you have the accomplishments of Jairus. He's described as a ruler of the synagogue. That is, he's a man of prominence. He's a man of position. He's a man of prestige. A man of privileges, of prosperity. A man of power in his community. He's a man who, as some would say, had it all. Or so it seemed. But at this point in time, whatever he had, none of it mattered. His one concern is his wee girl. Just because he's a man in public office, you notice, it didn't exempt him from trying situations. Money can buy a lot of things. Power can get people to places of authority and all the rest of it. But none of those things can stop the trials coming, can they? When Jairus spoke, people listened. It's believed that when he would walk into a room, people stood up in recognition of his authority. They would hardly do that for you these days, would they? But now he finds himself in a place where none of these things matter. These intruders of sickness and death couldn't care less who or what this man is. Suddenly he is, in the midst of life, he's brought face to face with death. Just now, position and possession meant nothing. Here's a man who has religion, but his religion is powerless to help him through this difficulty. Now, you may be sure that he would have traded everything he had just to be able to change his circumstances, but he couldn't lift a finger to do a thing about it. Ever been there? He had everything he thought he would ever need, but when the crunch came, he found he had nothing. Nothing of any value. Is this somebody here this evening? Your business going well for you? Are you doing all right? As people would say, as far as work is concerned, as far as family are concerned. But let me ask you, if death were to enter your home, would you find comfort in your possessions? In your position? In your popularity? Would that set your heart and mind at ease? If the death angel were to come and take a dear one out of your family, maybe a child. When I was only three year old, my baby sister died. She was only seven months. In those days, we had no car. I don't know what happened to the, the, the child, but the, the doctor said, you'll have to bring her to the surgery. And it was a cold winter's evening and my mum and dad had to walk I think between three and four miles to the doctors wheeling a pram at the dark of night with the wind howling and the rain coming down the child caught pneumonia and died just seven months it didn't mean much to me I was only three at the time and they tell me I used to break my, my parents heart when are you breaking her back Hard to take, isn't it? Here's Jairus. And suddenly he's brought to realize 
But the real treasure in life is death is threatening to come and take away that little one. He calls her in verse 23, my little daughter. And in Luke's account of this incident, we're told that she's his only daughter, 12 years of age. I'm sure probably the apple of her daddy's eye. You know, some people spend their entire lives amassing power and wealth. But when tragedy comes, these things mean nothing. Death doesn't care if you're a millionaire or a pauper. Sickness and sorrow don't care if you have power or position. What do they care about your popularity? The death angel is no respecter of persons. Jairus is a ruler, a ruler of the synagogue. It didn't stop this tragedy coming. You know, you could live in the house of God and still not stop tragedy coming if the Lord ordains it. Beloved, listen. All hell couldn't care less about you tonight, who you are, what you've done. When tragedy comes calling, you need somebody greater than yourself to lean on. You need help, and you need to know where to go for that help. And when it comes, when death comes, life suddenly comes into a clear focus, doesn't it? Well, you can't. You can't buy health and strength. You can buy the best bed in the shop. You'll not buy a night's sleep. You can't buy life. You can't buy a place in heaven, no. But you can have it for free. Of course, before you can have that place in heaven, you have to want it badly enough to finish with sin. And that's usually the stumbling block. People are not willing to give up their sin. Not willing to trust Christ. Why? Can anybody explain what is worth holding on to for a few more days? To miss heaven for it? And go out into the blackness of darkness forever? To be tormented? Your own mind whipping you? I was going to say day after day, but there's no day in hell. It's all night. Why would anybody volunteer for that? What do you think matters now? Whatever it is, it ceases to matter. When death comes, the Jairus, Jairus knew where to go. And he did the right thing. Notice the attitude of Jairus. Verse 22, when he saw him, that is the Lord Jesus, he fell at his feet. Somewhere Jairus had heard about the Lord Jesus. Interestingly, the name Jairus means one whom God enlightens. Somehow God had opened this man's eyes and he saw Jesus as his only hope. Beloved, he's your only hope tonight if you're not saved. Now, at this very moment, as his daughter is lying there dying, Jesus, I was going to say, just happened to be in the district, but there are no coincidences with God. The Lord had this all planned way back in eternity. The Savior was in the district. He had just recently come ashore down there in Galilee. All in the divine plan. It allowed the two paths to cross, the Savior and Jairus. Jesus was passing by. But notice, notice how this man of position and power came before Christ reverently, prayerfully, passionately. He fell at his feet. And that word fell is from a Greek word that means to descend from a higher place to a lower one. Jairus was humbled in the presence of the Lord of glory. Beloved, you need to do the same. 
We say with all due respect, you can't come to Christ boasting your own worth. You and I are nothing but guilty sinners in his sight. And we beg you recognize that truth. Because until you do, you'll never be saved. We can't boast any great deeds we've done, giving to charity, being good to our neighbors, and all that. You hear it all the time. It means nothing. Supplying flowers to the church. I've known people go to their grave, and that's what they were depending on for heaven. Why put flowers on the communion table? That's not where salvation is found. These things will not set anybody on the road to heaven. Notice the acknowledgement of Jairus, verse 23. My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands upon her. You see the concern there of a father for his child. I'm grieved when I see parents leading their children along, showing no concern for the child's well-being, I mean spiritually speaking. I see fathers take their wee lad to the park to kick a ball on Sunday or take him out for a walk or take the dog for a walk, anything. Take the children everywhere and anywhere. I hear wee children using foul language. Where are they hearing it? In the home. There are parents in this area, beloved, and they're rearing children for hell and they don't realize it. Here's a man, he's recognized nothing in himself. He comes to the Savior and says, Lord, I'm helpless. Can't do a thing. But I believe, Lord, you can. That's faith. That's where you need to come tonight if you ever want to see heaven. Can't save yourself. With all due respects, the best of intentions and all your religiosity It'll do nothing for you. The scripture says all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Something to be discarded. Your sin is taking you to hell. And you're hopeless on your own. You need Christ. Lord, I can't save myself. But I believe you can save me. Do you believe it, beloved? Pitiful dialogue. But then it was a painful day. Notice the interest of the Savior. Verse 24, Jesus went with him. Now, when, when Jairus shared this story, the Lord Jesus lent a sympathetic ear. The Lord was interested and, and started out toward Jairus' home. Some celebrities in this world are totally unapproachable. Some have been known, they've been approached, asked for an autograph. And they've just turned their back, walked away. Don't know what makes them celebrities. But the Lord Jesus didn't behave like that. He was interested and he started out for Jairus' home. You know, the Lord loves to hear that people need him. He says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. He loves to hear you come and pour out your heart's need and desire before him. Casting all your care upon him. Why? For he careth for you. Verse Peter 5, 7. He's always more willing to bless than many are to be blessed. The hymn writer recognized that when he said, "I I was sinking deep in sin, sinking to rise no more, overwhelmed by guilt within. Mercy, I did implore. Ah, but then... The master of the sea, he came and he lifted me up. Notice the intrusion of sickness here. Verse 25 to 34, bring this woman on the scene who was suffering from a hemorrhage for for 12 years. Now, some people would suggest that maybe there's a connection here between this woman and Jairus' daughter for the child was 12 year old. Whether that's right or not, it doesn't matter. Here's a pitiful condition. Uh, And 
she came in the crowd that was following the Savior along the road towards Jairus' house. And when she touched the Savior's garment, she was miraculously healed. We read that in the passage. And the Savior took time to stop and communicate with her. This was all taking up time. And, and Jairus must surely have been wondering about his weak hair. Well, you know, every second felt like an hour. Lord, you're taking time to talk to this woman. And I need you at our house. The weak hair's dying. Every second was crucial. Surely, surely there's no time for any of this delay. I mean, this, at least this woman was breathing. She was on her feet even if she was doubled in two. His wee child was breathing her last. Yet there's no mention that Jairus even said a word. As far as his family were concerned, this was a race against time. But he didn't interrupt the Savior, but waited Waited till the Savior was free to continue. This is the response of faith. He, here's a man who, who knows he can't help himself, yet he's, and in spite of the desperation of the time, he's prepared to wait on the Lord's time. Can we not all learn from that, beloved? I mean, isn't it so, child of God, we all want our prayers answered yesterday, don't we? And sometimes the Lord just says, hold on, Wait. I'll answer my way, my time. Then you have the invasion of sorrow, verse 35. While he yet spake, there, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, Thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? During that time of delay with this dear woman, right, we sympathize with her. She'd been 12 years doubled in two and she was in pain. She'd tried everything. She'd spent every penny she could afford and was no better. And we rejoice in what the Lord did for her that day. A simple touch of the hem of his garment. The finished work. And she was healed. And, you know, it's cause for rejoicing. But how did Jairus feel? Was his world not falling apart? Did he not feel that the Lord had let him down? Were his dreams not shattered when they bring the news? Listen, the wee lassie has passed away. If it hadn't been for the crowd, the wee girl might still be alive. Tell me, is the crowd keeping somebody here from coming to Christ? Maybe somebody will say in his heart, I'm glad I have the crowd. That gives me an excuse not to come. <laughs> Listen, you need to come, no matter what the crowd think. If that should be the case, then we have to say one day, Listen, beloved, one day you will curse the crowd. But it'll be too late to do anything about it. The crowd may laugh you into hell and not laugh you out of it. Let me ask you, what will the Lord have to do to get you to come to himself? Will he have to come and take your child away? It was, after all, the thought of losing his daughter that brought Jairus to the Savior's feet. What's it going to take to bring you to his feet? Notice thirdly here, there was a powerful deliverance. Verses 36 to 43. Here's a, a tragic situation transformed itself into an impossible one. The little one is no longer sick. She's dead. Has, that, has the Lord let Jairus down? I mean, if this, if this happened to you, would you refuse to have anything more to do with the Lord? Because that's the way some people react Had Jairus' faith failed him? Can you imagine the scenes of pandemonium back at the house? Jairus has gone out down the road to seek the Lord, but he hasn't come back yet, and now the child's dead. They must have been thinking, well, the Lord has let us all down. He has failed. Oh, never. He can't fail. Yes, the Lord allowed it. He's God. He may not 
give you and me everything we want, but he will not fail to give you everything you need. There's an exclamation of faith here, verse 36. As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. But believe what? The child's dead. In effect, Jesus is saying, Don't believe all you hear. They, they had been told. She was dead. Verses 38 and 39 indicate that as, as they approached the house, the family and neighbors had already gathered around and they're weeping and wailing because of the death of the child. Well, of course they would. But Jesus is saying, listen, don't, don't believe even what you think you know. Wait until you get the whole story. Wait till you get the truth of the matter. In verse 40, they laughed him to scorn because he said, She's not dead, but she's sleeping. Don't believe what you think you see. Just believe me, he says. Trust me. Oh, it always pays, doesn't it, to give heed to what the Lord says. I don't know how many times I've listened to some people trying to convince others how good they are. I suppose it. In truth, they're trying to convince themselves. But it's not, it's not oneself a person has to convince. It's the Lord. But he's, he's not convinced by somebody's self-recommendation. What the Lord wants to hear is how unworthy we are. How unworthy that soul is of the least of God's mercies. If any man will be, ever be anything before God, he'll have to begin by recognizing he's nothing. Yes, it's a humbling thought, isn't it? But God has no room for pride. The Lord hates a proud look. Oh, the, the, the devil will tell you you don't need to be saved. Look at the good life you live. Why some of those... Christians think they're so holy and you, you could show them how to live, couldn't you? Do you know this? You know something? There are some unsealed people who could show Christians how to live. I shouldn't have to say that, but it's the truth. Surely God wouldn't send you to hell. You're the sort of stuff heaven's made of. But the devil's a liar, isn't he? It's true, God will not send you to hell. Your sin will take you there. You're already on your way there. People say, you know, I, I, I sort of, I, I'd, I'd love to speak to that individual about his need of the Savior, but I'd, I'd be afraid of putting him off. Putting him off what? He's already put off. He's a sinner. He needs to hear the words of life. He needs to hear about a, a saviour who's able to save him and change him, make something of him. Satan will tell others that they could never keep God's salvation, so no point in you being saved. Well, it's true. Nobody can keep it. That's why the Lord does the keeping. <clears throat> Maybe they can't see that. Well, take it from those who know. Ask anyone who is saved if they keep themselves or if the Lord does the keeping. We know what they'll say. But listen, whatever you do, beloved, do not spend your time looking for excuses not to be saved. Come to Christ and be saved. Otherwise, you volunteer yourself for hell. And you don't want that. Notice the exclusions of faith. Verses 37 to 40. Jesus put everybody out of the house who didn't believe. Now don't miss this. Those who lacked faith were removed. He put them out. Those who didn't believe that he could raise that child, they're put outside. And beloved, as far as heaven is concerned, all who refuse to believe that Jesus saves will not get in. be out. 
Faith believes the incredible. Faith sees the invisible. Faith receives the impossible. But unbelief receives nothing from the hand of God. James said, without faith, it is impossible to please him. Notice the exhibition of faith. Jesus came into that room where the, uh, the young girl was and took her by the hand and said, Damsel, I say unto thee, arise. Death says, I have you. I've got you. All hope is gone. You're mine now. There's no hope for you. But Jesus says, arise. Live. Oh, when the giver of life came into that room, death had to flee. Indeed, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. What power there is in the spoken word of God. He only had to speak, and death was conquered. And beloved, he only has to say the word, and you will be raised from the deadness of your sin. And you may live. What evidence is there that he can give this life? Verse 42, straightway, immediately, right away, the damsel arose and walked. She rose up, she walked, she spoke, she was able to eat, verse 43. The people were astonished with a great astonishment, verse 42 says. That phrase comes from Two words that carry the meaning to throw out of position, to be out of one's mind. Literally, what Jesus did blew their minds and left them standing in amazement and the mouth hanging open. But that's, that's the whole thing about God's salvation, isn't it? The Lord can still astonish people by the changes he makes when he saves a man or woman. We've heard testimonies of some who God lifted. I think of a man who years ago attended our Cross Guard Church. A man who drank himself, drank the shirt of his back, drank himself and the family out of the home. Well, the Lord saved him, changed him, gave him back his family, gave him a new home. And he could testify, Jesus saves and satisfies. He can give you life. He can fix your broken life. If you let him have it. A Methodist preacher by the name of Luther Bridgers. He was born in 1884. He married Sarah Veach. Their marriage was blessed with three lovely sons. Pastor Bridgers accepted an invitation to preach at a conference in Kentucky in 1910. So he left his wife and family in the care of her father. Went on the trip. He had two weeks of heart-stirring meetings. And he couldn't wait to phone home and tell his wife of how the Lord had been so blessing the meetings. He was so excited. When he rang home, it wasn't his wife's voice on the other end of the phone. He listened in stunned silence as the news was relayed to him there'd been a fire at the family home and his wife and three boys were dead. It's absolutely distraught. But he learned to lean on the Savior and in those tearful moments he sat down with a pen and he wrote these words. There is within my heart a melody. Jesus whispers sweet and low. Fear not. I am with thee in all of life's ebb and flow. Feasting on the riches of his grace. Resting neath his sheltering wing. Always looking on his smiling face. That is why I shout and sing. Though he sometimes leads through waters deep, trials fall across my way. Though sometimes the path seems rough and steep, 
see his footprints all the way. You've sung the hymn, haven't you? Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Tell me, do you know him this evening? Are you in a predicament? Are you anxious as Jairus was? Are you impatient because of things that are happening? Are you anxiously looking for life and can't find it? Amazing, you know, the struggle that goes on out there. There are people who seem to have everything. I think of people in Hollywood, not talking Hollywood County down, Hollywood, America, in the movie industry. They get their name in lights and they attract dozens of flashing cameras and they get their picture in the paper and they, they're in the limelight and they think they're living. And you know, when you look at them closely, they're as miserable as sin itself. Why? Because they're looking and they're running after and clinging to the things of this old world. And it does nothing for the soul. Ah, but look at, look at that dear soul. He lives in that wee cottage and maybe it's hardly two brown pennies to rub together. And that dear one loves the Lord. There's a smile on her face. You walk past her door, you'll hear her singing the praises of Jesus. She's got something. Beloved, listen, this salvation's real. If you're miserable tonight, praise the Lord. Because he's able to deliver. Yes, when people are miserable and won't admit it, the problem comes. But recognize it. If your life's empty tonight, this is where the answer lies. Christ is everything. What do you think Jairus thought of the Savior when he saw his wee girl raised to newness of life? Did he not go on his way rejoicing? Was he not praising the Lord? Was he not walking on air? What joy must have flooded his soul when he saw what the Lord can do? And beloved, he can do the same for you, I and far more, if you just let him. Would you let him save you tonight? Why go on in sin, and misery, and despair? Cast yourself upon him even now. Trust him for full salvation. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Take away my sin. Make me a child of God. Fit me for heaven. And beloved, you can put your head on the pillow tonight and you'll know it's now well with my soul. Would you do it? Listen, if you're in the meeting not saved, I'm not embarrassing anybody, but if you're concerned, would you speak to us or speak to any of the elders of the church? I'd love you to know that it is well with your soul that you're on your way to heaven and home. Let's bow together in prayer. Loving Father, we thank Thee that there is a Saviour tonight who is able to save to the uttermost all that come unto God by Him. We're glad, Lord, it doesn't matter what the circumstances may be. Whatever difficulties may have to be overcome, we thank Thee when we start at the cross. We can cast every care 
upon him, for he cares for us. Lord, we pray thee. If there's a dear one in this meeting or tuned in at home, needing the Savior, looking for that peace that passes all understanding, they'll not find it in the world. But oh, that grace would be given that they might just simply lay hold upon Christ, the one whom to know is life eternal. Bless thy word even to this end. May souls come and trust thee tonight. And may Christ be glorified in salvation blessing. Part us in thy fear and with thy favor. Speak on to every waiting heart. And magnify thy name even in the salvation of the lost. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>